Thank you, thank you, Otmar. I, I regret it a lot, of course, not to be there, but I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, so, it's this, this talk, you have heard sort of similar versions, probably some of you from Alexei Mamonov and even myself, perhaps. So we keep working on this topic and now we have a much better mathematical understanding of what is going on. And, and at the end, I will uh, tell you about uh, current work. I mean, we, we, we are pretty excited because it looks like this, this approach can be extended to do more, much more than what we thought originally. So anyway, I won't present those new results, but I will tell you a little bit more about about this approach and you know more mathematical foundation for it essentially so that's the purpose of my talk and this is joint work with vladimir druskin alexei mamonov mike zaslavsky and your zimmerling uh, who's uh, a little bit newer to the team he's a postdoc with me excellent postdoc okay so um I will begin with a setup. So I, I write the problem in a rather general setting. Uh, so we are looking at uh, wave equation and, uh, and uh, sorry, I, I write the equation here. Uh, so it's a generic wave equation where T is of course time and uh, A is, a, is, a, is an operator which is um, self-adjoint. Uh, I assume that it's self-adjoint, second order, order elliptic partial differential operator A. And in this operator, we have um, uh, the, the medium uh, that we want to find in inverse scattering this model by coefficients. And these coefficients would be, let's say, wave speed or wave impedance. Okay, so this is the equation and the wave is denoted by W here. And uh, it is generated by a source which is located at XS, which emits some signal, which is denoted here by F of T. We, uh, we assume that this signal is a pulse, so it's a short, short uh, duration signal uh, that is emitted by the source. And because the wave that is generated by the source S depends on the source. Obviously, I have an index S here for this wave. Okay, and before the source, before the source acts, uh, the medium is quiet. Okay, so now the geometrical setting is, is important. So we are going to work in a domain omega, which is really a rectangular box, which is a truncation of an infinite domain. Now how you get this domain, usually in the time domain, you can do that. So you just truncate the domain because the problem is causal. You have finite propagation speed and you always um, uh, sort of observe the wave over a finite time. Uh, so you can truncate the medium. And here, however, I'm going to assume that I have a boundary, which I call the accessible boundary, which is closed to the sensors, which are shown here with crosses. So I, I suppose that I have a collection of sensors which we usually call array. And the, it is important that these sensors are near this accessible boundary, which is modeled by Neumann conditions. The reason for that is because in the construction that I describe, we actually assume that the wave propagates uh, in one way uh, that is in one direction away from the sensor, so only on one side, we don't have a wave going up. Now, of course, if you don't have a boundary, but you know the medium, uh, in particular, if it's homogeneous medium above the array, then you can do some mapping to transform data to, to, to such a thing. Okay, so that's what I'm going to assume. So my waves are going to leave the sources they are going to propagate in this medium, they are going to scatter and they are going to be seen back. Okay, um, so the, the data that we collect are simply measurements of these waves. And we have an array of M sensors, so little m will, will be throughout my talk, the number of sensors. 
and each sensor can act as a source and a receiver. Okay. And we, we make measurements at distinct times. So T is equal to J tau. So tau is the, is the time sampling, which has to be carefully chosen depending on what frequency content is in this signal. And, um, and uh, we measure for two N time instants. Okay, so the inverse problem is to, is to determine the medium in this domain from such data. And what we want, so what we are preaching here is that ideas from reduced order modeling could be very useful in solving this inverse scattering problem. And so most of my talk will be about how we construct a reduced order model from this data. Okay, now in order to describe the reduced order model, it is and you know that's how in fact we, we we got to understand better the mathematics of this of this construction is to view the wave propagation as a dynamical system um so it's a dynamical system with initial state that is determined by the source so what that means is that um even though i have an equation in the beginning that has a source here and uh, zero initial conditions. Now I want to transform this problem into one with an initial condition and no force. And one way to do this that is convenient for us is to work with the even time extension of the wave and therefore of the data. So here I write the even time extension and this is what I call my data. So uh, DJ, J stands for time index at which I measure, R, S stands for the receiver and the, and the source. So my data is going to be the even extension of what I measure. Now, I want to, to point out that, that we are really not losing any information here. And in fact, this even extension can be obtained from what we measure for the simple reason that we are assuming that the medium is known and homogeneous near the sensor of the uh, near the sensors. And if you look here, you see that for time, for negative time, the wave, because of the initial condition, the, this guy is going to be non-zero only for very short time, which is within the support of the of the pulse. Okay, and over that time, due to causality, this guy is only going to depend on the medium near the sensors, which we know, which is homogeneous. So therefore, this can be computed for J tau for time instances that are uh, longer than the duration of the pulse. Then this is exactly the same as what we measure. Okay, so we don't lose anything by doing this time even time extension. Now, the advantage of doing this even time extension is first of all that we can formulate the problem where we have now an initial condition on the wave, on this even extension of the wave. And moreover, by doing some sort of a little bit involved calculus with the operator A, which is self-adjoint and positive definite, then one can show that you can write this data as an inner product between the solution u of this equation and some function b. These functions b depend on the signal that we emit. They depend on the operator a, but only locally near the sensor. So point. So we call them sensor functions. They are kind of like almost like delta, delta functions uh, localized around the location. So this BS is a function corresponding to the source S and it is a function that we can prove it's localized near the source and it can be computed. Okay, so of course we, so, so this is a very advantageous thing for the calculus that we want to do because we are now writing our data in this inner product form which takes this, in fact, this symmetric form here, where what I did is I wrote this wave U, which solves this initial value problem. So I wrote it formally using the operator, 
Uh, so the solution of this of this equation is just the cosine is the cosine of time square root of a acting on the initial condition. Okay, so this is the data. So this transformation allows me to write the data in this form. Okay, now what we are going to do, since we have m excitations, we are going to group them all together in this vector b which is the initial state for our dynamical system that we will define. And so this way we work, we, we get rid of some indices. Okay, so we don't have these source indices anymore, but now we have to understand that we are doing operator, uh, we are doing calculus with blocks. Okay, so this is kind of like, uh, so we will do eventually block algebra. Okay. So now, what is the dynamical system? So the dynamical system is the system with state, which are called in this business the snapshot, which are the solutions of the equation of the initial value problem that I just showed, evaluated at the discrete times, separated by the, the, the step tau, okay? And here I just wrote again these solutions by, by using the operator calculus. So this is the solution of this equation is given by the cosine. The solution of this equation is given by the cosine of J tau square root of A acting on B. So important to know is that we don't know this, this snapshot, of course. We only know the initial snapshot which can be computed because the median is known near the sensors. And we know the data matrices. So now these are matrices M by M for each instance at which we make measurements. And they are given by the, uh, the snapshots kind of, uh, so this is the transpose of this, this, uh, of this excitation vector. And so I use this notation here. So I, I substitute what U is in here. And I use these brackets kind of like remind us of inner products. Of course, this is not an inner product because the result is a matrix. So this is an M by M symmetric matrix. Okay, but I will use this notation throughout. Okay, so this is the state of the dynamical system. And now I want to write what is the dynamical system. So in order to write the dynamical system, that is the evolution of the state, we introduce this operator, which we call the propagator operator, which is given by the cosine of tau. So tau is the time sampling rate, square root of A. And using this operator, we can write the snapshots uj, excuse me, as the cosine of j tau square root of AB, so that I already had on the previous slide. And here we're just doing a trick. So we write tau square root of A as the R cosine of the operator P. And of, of course, when we do that, we realize that this UJ is simply a polynomial in the operator P acting on the initial state. And this is called the Chebyshev polynomial of the first kind. Now, once we have this, then we can write the, the dynamical system, which is simply given by the recurrence relation of the Chebyshev polynomials. Uh, and these are just sort of like the trigonometric identities for the cosine. So this is the dynamical system, which describes the wave propagation as we observe it at time sample time. Okay, so this is the dynamical system. If we knew this dynamical system, we would know everything there is to know about the wave. So now, of course, we want to understand, so we have the data which is given by this kind of like, it's not in a product again, because this is a matrix. So it's kind of, it, it's, it's given by this quantity. So we only know U essentially projected against the, 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 the sense of functions. And from this data, we want to see if we can learn the dynamical system. And so what we realized is that what we are doing here is in fact, 
we are obtaining a Galerkin projection of the dynamical system where the approximation space is the space spanned by the snapshot. Okay, so we are measuring up to time 2n minus 1. And by that, we are achieving an approximation in the space spanned by the solutions of the wave equation for the first half of this snapshot. Okay, so I call this the, uh, the approximation space. And you notice here that I use for sort of like, like a linear algebra notation where U is, is what is called the quasi matrix. Okay, so, so you can think of it as a matrix, is a matrix with, with how many columns. So each snapshot has M columns corresponding to the fact that we have M sensors and we have, uh, we have N such a snapshot. So therefore you can think of this as a matrix with N times M columns and then infinity many rows corresponding to this X, okay. So the point is that this space is not known. Of course, so, so in the reducer, I, I have to say, in the reduced order modeling community, one typically constructs reduced order models using Galerkin projections. This is where we got the idea in, in, you know, to understand what we are doing. But in fact, what is usually done is that one computes the snapshots, so one doesn't solve inverse problems. So that is the, you know, one knows the equation and one computes snapshots and then does projections. So what is interesting in what we do, I think, is that we don't know this space and yet we can achieve this Galerkin projection by just from the data measurement. So in that sense, we call the reduced order model that we construct data driven. Okay, so to introduce the Galerkin projection, let us look at the Galerkin approximation of the solution of the wave equation, okay? So I take each snapshot and I write it as one does in the Galerkin sense as a linear combination of the vectors in the space. So that is in linear algebra notation, I write it as U times GJ and GJ are these matrices, which are the matrices of Galerkin coefficients. And one six, of course, this Galerkin coefficient by the usual condition that if you plug this approximation into your equation, which is the evolution of the system that is this dynamical system, then you want the residual to be orthogonal to the approximation space. So that is what I wrote here. This is the typical Galerkin condition. Notice in particular that by the definition of my space, this, um, these coefficients, the, the first Galerkin coefficients, the first n, n of them are trivial because of course, for the first, for j is equal zero up to n minus one, these guys are in the space. I mean, these guys are in the space. So we achieve an exact representation. So we know the first n Galerkin coefficients are given here where i n is the m by m identity matrix. And of course, but, but this is written for all indexes j, not just for the first n ones. Okay, so now I'm going to take this Galerkin equation and I write it for all the L and I obtain in matrix form this equation. So this is exactly the same equation that I had. Now I, 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 I write it in, 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 in matrix form. So here the matrix M is what one calls in, in Galerkin language, the mass matrix. And it's the matrix given by the product of the snapshots, UL and UJ. And the matrix S here is given by um, the product of UL with the propagator acting on UJ. Okay, so we obtain this equation and this is where we can see that the reduced order model can be computed just from the data because these matrices, even though we don't know the approximation space U, okay, we don't know this U, However, we can compute these matrices M and S from the data. And so here is where this symmetry that we had is very useful. So 
If I look at the LJ entry of the mass matrix, which is the product between the L and the J snapshot. Now here, what I did is I wrote that each snapshot is a Chebyshev polynomial acting on the propagator and then acting on the initial condition. And now because the propagator is a symmetric operator, I can put this in this uh, on the other side. And then here, I'm just using recursion relation of Chebyshev polynomials, which are just the trigonometric identities for the cosine. Okay, so I go from here, here. And then of course, when I look at this, I recognize that what I have here is just a linear combination of the data that I know at time steps L plus J and at time step L minus J. Okay, and then a similar calculus gives me the stiffness matrix S in terms of the data. Okay, so what we are trying to do here again is we are trying to get a Galerkin projection of this dynamical system without knowing the state. And uh, so we only know the data from this data we get this Galerkin equation with matrices M and S, which are computable from the data. And so therefore this means that we can compute the Galerkin coefficients for all J. Okay, now in order, now we are going to write the reduced order model, which is a dynamical system itself, which mimics the exact dynamical system that we want to approximate. And in order to do that, I'm going to take the mass matrix that we computed from the data, and I'm going to take the square root of this mass matrix using the Cholesky factorization, which is in block form here because everything is block calculus. And so this R is an upper triangular matrix, which has this form. Okay, so in, since I know M, I can compute the Cholesky factorization. By the way, this is, um, the calculation of the Cholesky factorization, and in fact, the fact that below we have to invert this, this, this Cholesky factor is the only ill-conditioned part of the construction of the reduced order model. And this has to be properly regularized in, in, in practice. I can tell you more about that later if you want. So, okay, so now if I take the square root of this mass matrix, then, uh, and I multiply my Galerkin equation, which is this equation, on the left by the inverse of the, of R transpose, then I obtain this equation which looks uh, just like the dynamical system, the exact dynamical system, but now it's in the reduced order model space. And the state, that is the snapshot for this dynamical system, is given by this matrix R times GJ, where GJ are the Galerkin coefficients that we can compute. Okay, and the wrong propagator, which is the replacement of the propagator that describes the exact uh, propagation through the medium, so I call it P wrong, is given by the stiffness matrix that is computed from the data times R inverse transpose to the left times R inverse transpose to the right. Okay, so even though we don't know the state, we obtain a reduced order model like this. And now on the next slide, I want to show you that in fact, this reduced order model is indeed a projection. So I'm going to now relate P ROM. I'm going to write P ROM as a projection of the true operator P and also the state of the room as a projection of the true state. And for that, it's useful to look at this Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization of the space in which we do the approximation. So again, the columns of the block columns of this U are the snapshots, the first N snapshots. And so if you do the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization, of this, you get this factorization, which in linear algebra, we call it the QR factorization. And so the point is that this is a, a causal construction. So in other words, the basis in V 
his closure, so it depends. Uh, and so, you know, the, the first column of V is in the same space as the first column of U. And the second column of V is in the space spanned by the first two columns of U and so on. So that's causal in that sense. And the columns of V, of course, are orthonormal form an orthonormal basis of the approximation space. Now, this R that arises in this gram schmidt orthogonalization is nothing else but the Cholesky factor in the factorization of the mass matrix, which is computable from the data. And if you recall the expression of the stiffness matrix S like this, you use the gram schmidt factorization in here. Then you write the wrong propagator, which I defined on the previous slide like this. So if I write R in terms of U and V, I obtain precisely this expression. So this shows you that indeed the wrong propagator is nothing but a projection of the true propagator on the space of the snapshot. And so the similarly, the wrong snapshots are, are, uh, are uh, given by um, a projection of the snapshots in the approximation space. Okay, so now this construction turns out to be a very successful thing, the right way, the right thing to do, uh, at least from the physics point of view, because you see the ROM that we get, particular, if you look at the ROM that we get here, and you remember that the first GJs are just sort of like the identity uh, blocks with zeros and just one identity. So uh, if you look, if you if, if you look here, you notice that this matrix R is in fact the matrix of the first n ROM snapshots. Okay, so this R, so this first block column is the first ROM snapshot. The second block column is the second ROM snapshot and so on. And you see that they sort of, and, and the point is here that row by row, each row corresponds to how the wave propagates deeper and deeper in the medium. And so it respects causality in this way. In fact, that's how we figured originally this, this kind of construction. And, and here I show an illustration for one dimensional simulation where here I plot the matrix of the snapshots U, okay? And so here on the vertical axis is time running downwards and on the horizontal axis is, oh, so, sorry. Um, so, so, uh, okay. Uh, is the other way around. Okay, sorry, it's the time. So, so the time is on the horizontal axis and, uh, and the, the coordinate, that is the depth as we proceed from the array inside the medium is on the vertical axis. And you see that if you look at the solution displayed like this, you see this sort of upper triangular structure. And so this is just the causality of the wave. Huh? So for the times of the first time, that corresponds to the first column here, the wave. So time is equal to zero. The wave is at the sensor. As the time advances, the wave moves away from the sensor and it proceeds deeper in the medium. Okay, so it gives you this, this triangular structure, which is of course preserved in the reduced order model construction that we have. And moreover, so that's how we, we came up with this. Originally, we said, wait a minute, what we are doing here in gram schmidt another way of viewing this, you know, from the QR factorization point of view, what you're doing in QR factorization is you are searching a basis in which if you represent your original matrix, that matrix takes upper triangular form. And well, our matrix is almost upper triangular to begin with, so the transformation, which is this matrix V, should not be too far from the identity. Okay, so that is what allowed us to say, oh, okay, this matrix V is, is almost an identity and it is almost independent of the medium. That turns out to be the case in the sense that it depends on the smooth part of the medium, that is the kinematics, but not on the reflectors. 
And this is something that we, just a second, let me see how I'm doing on time. Oh, I still have, I still have 15 minutes, right? Okay, so. so um, you have 15. Okay, yes. sorry. So, okay, so we can prove actually in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in sort of media that are, lay so in layered media or in waveguides that have reflectors that are, you know, more or less sort of like uh, uh, horizontal. At least there, we now have theorems which show that um, the, the uh, which, which prove that the, the, the matrix V of snapshots is close to the identity if you choose the time sampling well enough. Okay, so we have theorems for that. But for now, I'm just going to show you that this matrix V the, the, that contains the basis are, um, uh, you know, it's independent of the, of the reflectivity of the medium by just showing you pictures. Okay, so here in one dimension, I can write one dimension in the one dimensional problem is beautiful because you can write everything in travel time coordinates. And so you can take the wave speed out of the picture and then the reflectivity is modeled by variations of the acoustic impedance, which is plotted here. Uh, for this illustration, so you see you have an impedance which has a, a four jumps, so one, two, three, four, and that defines four reflectors in the medium. And here I plot the snapshots of the wave for different time, time steps. And uh, here with blue, I plot the snapshots in the homogeneous medium that is corresponding to a constant impedance where there is no scattering. So you see in blue, just a pulse that just propagates undisturbed in the medium. And then here with green, I plot the snapshots which are computed in the medium where I have the four reflectors. And then you, you of course, you see scattering. Okay, so here I plot the orthogonal snapshots that is the columns of the, of the, of the, the V that is this orthogonalized snapshots which are supposed to be uh, focused at the wavefront and be weakly dependent on the medium if you choose the time, the, the time stepping correctly. And indeed, you see that this is the case. So uh, you see that here you can barely distinguish between the orthogonal snapshots in the homogeneous medium and the medium with the three inclusions. Okay, so you, uh, but of course, so this is not exact. So. And, and this is sort of like uh, the, the interplay between accuracy and the stability that you have to play because it turns out that if you make the time step too small, then the mass matrix that you construct is, too, is becoming more ill-conditioned and then the, the construction of the ROM becomes unstable. So um, you have to have a compromise. Okay, that is good enough. Time step small enough to have a decent approximation, but not too big, not too small. Okay, so this is in one dimensions. In uh, now we have also a theory for waveguides, so which is kind of the situation that we are in in the simulations because we have boundaries uh, because we uh, because we can truncate the medium uh, because of the boundaries uh, because of the of the finite time of observation. And here again, you see the snapshots corresponding to a source in the center. So here, by the way, uh, I have a medium that is smooth. And I suppose that I know this kinematic uh, model. So that is the smoothness of the model of the, or the smooth part of the wave speed. And then I have some jumps of the wave speed, which are illustrated here and, and um, and what this picture shows that the orthogonalized snapshots that do not depend much on these jumps, but they will they do they depend actually a lot on this time. Okay, so here is the solution of the wave equation if you don't have these reflecting structures, and uh, here is the solution of the wave equation. If you have the reflective structure, so you see this, you see 
you know, the, the reflection. So this looks very different than this. But if you look at the orthogonalized uh, snapshots, then they look very similar. Okay, so, uh, so now we have theorems for that, but okay, I didn't put them here. So now let's talk a little bit about inverse scattering. Um, and um, so here is, uh, here is now the point. So everything that I described so far, the data-driven wrong construction is obtained without any knowledge of the medium and the expression of the operator A. And that means, in fact, we, we wrote a paper to make that point that the construction that we have applies to all linear waves, elastic, electromagnetic, and sound. Now, of course, if we want to do quantitative inversion, then we need to know what we are inverting for, and we need to, to have a model of A. And an important thing that we have to ask is what can we estimate using this, this reduced order model? And one thing that you know I learned a long time ago from my esteemed colleague Bill Symes is that there is a very big difference between estimation of the kinematics, that is the smooth part of the wave speed, and the reflectivity, which is the rough part of the medium. And this is a picture that illustrates that. So here is the wave as it propagates in a medium with a smooth wave speed. So you have variations, but they are smooth, smooth with respect to the sort of the probing wavelengths that you have. And then you don't see any reflections. You just see the formation of the wave front, but the wave just goes through. Okay. And of course, back reflections occur if you have uh, sort of like uh, rough features, like for example, these cracks. Here. Okay, so imaging, the field of imaging is always concerned on, on, on finding these this, this, uh, rough structures, this, this, uh, you know, this reflectivity, and it assumes that the kinematics is known. Okay, so I'm going to assume for now that the kinematics is known. I will tell you at the end what we are doing about that. But so I assume that kinematics is known and I'm trying to find reflective structures. And I'm only going to describe um, a qualitative imaging method because I don't have much more time for that, for anything else, which is known as the method of back projection that appeared originally in work of Druskin, Mamonov, and Zaslavsky. And what this does is the following. So this is actually the first time this idea of using the reduced order model to generate internal waves has originated. And then since then, we have done some work on that. In fact, we share in Moscow as well for elliptic equations, not for hyperbolic equations. And we are still working on that idea. OK, so let's, let's describe this method. So suppose that you have an internal fictitious source at the point Y at which you want to image, which is localized there. So that would be the ideally that would be a delta distribution, a direct delta at Y. Okay. Well, we can't do direct delta. So let's consider the projection of this on our approximation space. And the projection is given by this VV transpose where V, I remind you, is the quasi matrix of orthogonalized snapshots. And what this notation means is exactly this. Okay, so this is remember that kind of bracket notation that is kind of like an inner product, but it's not because this is sort of like matrix five. Okay, so so I have this uh, this approximation, and which I write in linear algebra form like this: v of x, v transpose of y. Okay, now imagine that so you had this fictitious source. And then imagine that you let this wave evolve one time step, tau. Mathematically, this evolution is given by the propagator operator, which we don't know, acting on this initial wave. Okay, now if I write, so, so, so this, I, I can write this way, VV transpose P D delta Y X. Okay, this is an approximation really. Okay, so I approximate this by what I have in my uh, approximation space. And then now when I do that, 
I, and I substitute the, the expression of delta y here, then I recognize that this V transpose PV is nothing but the wrong propagator, which I can compute. Okay. And then the whole idea of the back projection imaging function is to take this wave and compare it with the wave you would get if you did this in a medium with no reflector, which you know. Okay, so I take this and I want to subtract what happens in the medium with no reflector. Now, I can't quite compute that because I don't know V, but I'm saying, hey, if I know the kinematics, V is approximately the same as V in the reference medium, which I know, and then I obtain this back projection imaging function. And this back projection imaging function turns out to be quite efficient. So as long as you know the kinematic model. So here is the, uh, the illustration for this medium where you have this kinematic model C0 that you suppose you know, and this is the true, the true wave speed, which has these jumps due to cracks. And this is the back projection image that you get using the idea that I just described. And this is the image that you get using the usual reverse migration, reverse time migration. And so you see that the image is much better. This one has lots of artifacts because of strong scattering between the crack. And here is a really complicated example, which is known to geophysicists as the Marmusi model. Again, we used here the smooth, we, we took this, we smoothed it out. So we assume we know this kinematics. And then if you run the back projection approach, you get this result. And then if you look, you see that it's quite successful at finding all these reflecting structures. And finally, since you like medical imaging in this crowd, so I, I have a simulation which shows a reconstruction of uh, a few phantoms. Now, in this case, what we are doing, we are actually measuring all around, but our ROM approach doesn't work we, uh, with all around data. So what we do is we split it in pieces and then we construct the ROM. And then we, we find images for which each such ROM and then we add them up. And so this is the back projection method that we get and this is the reverse time migration. Okay, so I have to wrap it up. So we have done some other things with this, this method. In particular, we have a paper that appeared in 2020 with Jörn Zimmerling, where we did a quantitative inversion of the reflectivity, where we showed how to use this methodology to, uh, to actually quantitatively estimate the reflectivity. We also, this is all the work that you have all, uh, some of you have heard about mapping data uh, to that corresponding to the Born approximation that is obtaining, uh, uh, doing almost a linearization of the scattering problem. And what we are really more, more excited about it now is work what, that we are doing with Garnier, Mamonov and Zimmerling where we have realized, so it's slightly different ROM construction, not this propagator. In fact, we, we, we construct a reduced order model of the operator A itself, not the cosine of tau A. So we construct a reduced order model of this operator A. And from that reduced order model, it looks like we can be quite successful in finding the smooth part of the wave speed that is the kinematic. And uh, that means that we can actually sort of have like a, you know, a complete approach using this reduced order model ma machinery for solving inverse scattering problems. And we also have um, uh, also a result where we're using reduced order modeling for manipulating waves to focus at desired places in the medium. Okay, so I think I stopped there. there.